But uh, as, I, uh, as I was, we were seeking the Lord uh, last week, the Lord just impressed a, a real, uh, a real uh, truth in my spirit. And uh, I started working on it, and by Wednesday, I was all finished with my message. That's never happened to me. Usually, I don't, I don't finish till like Saturday, or even sometimes Sunday mornings, I'm up at 5 a.m., and, and I'm, I'm pulling, te pulling texts together and pulling things together to give you the message for Sunday. And, and it was just, it just came like so flowingly to my spirit. And so um, I want to share that with you this morning. And I want you to uh, uh, take a moment to see my, uh, my message this morning. And so um, I'm waiting for my message. There we go. Christ lives in me. And we've read that statement many times in the Bible, and we've come across it many times in the Bible, but there is such a, para, para, uh, a paramount truth of this. And the question is, who's living in you? Who is having predominance in your life? And so I want you to turn with me, please, to Galatians chapter 2. It's the same Apostle Paul who wrote the book of Romans, and, and uh, we've been enjoying the book of Romans for, I don't know, over a year or maybe a, or so, but uh, uh, I hope you don't get tired of learning God's word. And, and um, So if you have your Bibles, turn with me, please, to Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. The Bible says, <clears throat> excuse me, the Apostle Paul is speaking here to the Galatian church. Everyone say he's speaking to the church. He's speaking to me. And he made, a he made this declaration, he made this proclamation to the church of Galatia. Galatia had some problems and he was there sent by the Holy Spirit as the Apostle of that ministry to to bring some correction and instruction to the Galatians. You might remember, before I read this scripture, you might remember in chapter 1, verse 1, it says, Oh, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you, who has put you under a demonic spell, who has influenced your decisions in being made righteous by the things of the flesh, you have moved away from what God was trying to do in your life by being made righteous through the Spirit. You can try to be made righteous by the flesh, by your carnal nature, by what you try to do. Or you can submit to the cross and submit to the life of Christ and let Christ, by the power of his Holy Spirit, begin to change you. When you allow that to happen, you're taking the truth of God's word from your head to your heart, to your spirit. And you're allowing, you know, we, we say Jesus on the inside working on the outside. But we a lot of times are working on the outside trying to change the inside. It doesn't work that way. Okay. Um, you have to do it the way God wants, wants it done. So here the Apostle Paul, he, he makes this declaration, he makes this proclamation. He says, I am not that I was, past tense, or I will be for future tense. He used the present tense, I am. Meaning that there was something that cataclysmic happened in his life. There was a paradigm shift in his life. Something took place in the Apostle Paul's life that now he can make this statement. It was an event that took place, and we all know that event. If you've been in my class on Romans, you exactly know what I'm talking about in Romans chapter 6. I am crucified with Christ. The Bible says we have been buried with him through baptism. That baptism is not water baptism. That baptism, it says we have been baptized with, is unto his death. Hello. Amen. Jesus didn't die in water. He died on the cross. And so Paul now says because of what took place in his life, there was, a, there was, a, there was an event that took place, a reality of the truth of what took place on the cross of Calvary. Yes, Jesus died for our sins, and he died 
to atone for our sins and to uh, justify us and to bring us into right relationship with God, but he did so much more. Not only did he die for our sins, but he died in order to free us from our sins. There's a difference. And so the Apostle Paul, right now, he, he begins this, this statement. He says, I am crucified. Present tense. In other words, he's living in the present tense experience. I am crucified with Christ. He wasn't crucified alone. He, he wasn't. He says, no, I am crucified with Christ. Now, that took place several years before his conversion. How could that be? Well, because Calvary has never, ever lost its power. The blood of Jesus has never lost its power. It's still as powerful today as it was 2,000 some odd years ago. The blood of Jesus on that cross still has the, the same power to save and to cleanse and to heal and to deliver as it did 2,000 years ago. It hasn't lost its power. And he says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. In other words, he's still walking around, he's still talking, he's still doing everything he needs to do. But he's saying, I was crucified with Christ, nevertheless I, I live. And then he, he qualifies that. He says, yet not I, but Christ liveth, not will live, not has lived, but a present now Christ liveth in me. Do you understand when you're born again, when you receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, the Spirit of Christ comes to reside inside of you. And He lives, He lives. Christ Jesus lives today. We sing that song and He walks with me, He talks with me along life's now way. He lives, He lives Salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within what? My heart. He lives within inside of me. Christ liveth in me. The same Christ that was crucified on Calvary, that rose from the dead on the third day, the Bible says, He shall quicken your mortal body when the Spirit dwells in you. And the question we have to ask ourselves is who's living in me? Am I living for myself? Am I living in my decisions? Am I living in my will? Am I living in my own way? Or is Christ living in me? Am I letting Christ come forth through me? Am I letting people see Christ in me rather than me? Because no matter what you do for Christ, no matter what you do in working for Him, or you do in the church, or, or whatever you may do to help out the church, and as good as that is, what is Christ doing through you? He says, the life that I now live in the flesh, meaning in this life, I am living by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and what? Gave himself for me. Gave himself for what? Yes, to atone for your sins. Yes, to be raised from the dead so you could be justified. Yes, all of those things to be sanctified and made righteous. Yes, but what else? So that Christ could live in you. So that Christ could come alive in you and when people would see you and see how you act and how you talk and how you walk and what you do and what you say and what you hear and how you conduct your life, when they would see that, they would say, surely I am seeing someone other than you. I'm seeing a personality that is inside of you. And I remember uh, my friend, I'm going to move this down a little bit so we don't bang as much do this. So I got this tucked inside my shirt. I don't know if I can pull the cord. Okay. 
And I remember my friend, Ed Aruda, used to, used to go to a barber, and I think I mentioned this before, and he would sit in the barber shop chair, and he, he spent a lot of time with Jesus, he used to love to pray. And one day he's, the barber's cutting his hair, and he looks in the mirror, and the, barber's, the barber is in tears. And he turns to him and he says, is there anything wrong? Is, is, are you going through a, a battle? Are you going through something I can pray for you with? And he says, no. He says, then why are you crying? He says, "Can I look into your eyes, I see Jesus. What a compliment. What a compliment to have someone who is, who's not even a Christian. The Bible wasn't even a Christian. But yet he could see the love of Jesus in this man's eyes and just burning in his soul. That's what we need today is we need the manifestation of I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live yet not I, but Christ lives in me. That's my introduction. We, what can we glean from the Bible concerning the dichotomy of this particular aspect? Dichotomy means two. Christ living in me and me living in me. There's an example in the Bible. Of what I'm talking about and we can find it in the life of Peter. And I'm going to kind of draw Peter into this thing. I'm going to kind of draw Peter into this Scenario so that you can understand and know and see a real person that was battling with this particular aspect of truth. Peter was a follower of Christ. Will you agree with me? Jesus was walking along and called Simon Peter, called him into the fold of being a disciple. The Bible says that Peter came and he followed the Lord. Understand now, here is a man who followed Jesus, and Jesus was ever present right there before him. He had the ultimate experience that all of us wish we could have had. Think about it. Of Jesus literally being with you. You being with him. Walking with him. Talking with him. Praying with him. Sitting with him. Learning from him. That was Peter's experience. And you would think that would be enough. But it wasn't. Peter had all of those experiences that you and I didn't have. And yet because of that. He still didn't have the commitment he needed to be with Jesus. Jesus. He went to church every day. He prayed every day. He praised God every day. Peter had a visual, intellectual, emotional, and a literal presence of Jesus in his life. Think about it. Peter had all of these things going for him in his life, yet he was what we would call today a carnal Christian. You say, Pastor, how can you say that about Peter? Well, how do we know that he was carnal? Let's look at Matthew for a moment. I'm going to digress from our text. Let's go to Matthew for a moment, chapter 16, starting with verse 13. Matthew 16 Starting with verse 13. It says, When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I am? Do I get that right? Okay. And they said, Some say thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, some others, Jeremiah, one of the prophets. And he said unto them, but whom say ye that I am? And who is the first one to speak up? Simon Peter. Now Simon Peter, here in this particular event, listened to God. 
So you can still be a carnal Christian and you can still listen to God. You hear me? Peter said to him, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Wow! Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed be thou, Simon by Jonah, that flesh and blood hath not revealed unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. Wow. He had a rhema word from God. He had a living word from God. God spoke to him, and that thought that he had didn't come from an origination of his studying or his knowledge. It came from God the Father. Right? Everybody would at this point would say that Peter was a spiritual man. You heard from God. God gave him a revelation. Next verse. And he said, I say unto thee, thou art Peter. Now watch this. And upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail. Wow. Next verse. And I will give unto thee, Peter, the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever you shall bind, you shall bound on earth, and, heaven, and whatsoever you shall bound loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Wow, Peter, what a ministry. Next verse. Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. Next verse. And from that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem, suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed and raised from the dead, or be raised again the third day. So not only did he tell his disciples, listen, I'm going to go to Jerusalem, I'm going to suffer so many things. Okay, I'm going to be killed, but I don't want you to think that's going to be the end. I'm going to, I'm going to rise on the third day. That's truth, right? Go to the next verse. Then Peter took him, Jesus, and began to rebuke him. Hold on a minute. Time out. The creature was rebuking the creator. One minute he had such great revelation... Follower of Jesus, visible presence of Jesus in his life. Sat and taught and ate and drank and sat with Jesus. Then Peter begins to rebuke Jesus and he says, Be it far from you, Lord, this shall not be unto you. In other words, what he's saying is, that's not going to happen to you. If I've got anything to say about it, I'm going to paraphrase a little bit. If I've got anything to say about it, I've got this sword right here. Anyone comes to try to kill you, I'll kill them. We know that was his attitude before too. Let's see what Jesus' response was to Peter. Next verse. But he turned and he said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Now I want you to understand one thing for money. He was never ever calling Peter Satan. He says he turned aside and he said to Peter. But he wasn't talking to Peter as a person. He was talking to the, the thought that came into Peter and Peter spoke that thought out came from the devil. Because it was the devil that was trying to prevent the crucifixion. And he said, get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense to me. Wow. Why was Peter in this condition? Because Peter could not say that Christ liveth in me. He could not make that statement based on a factual truth. Anyone know why? Why? Because Jesus hadn't gone to the cross yet. Because his old man was not crucified yet. Come on. And that's what happens in the flesh. We cannot put our glory in the flesh because if you are carnal, if you are not a if you are not a believer even. You cannot serve God in your own strength and your own natural abilities because it's impossible. And not only that, it's frustrating as anything. 
The only way that that can happen is when you become a born-again Christian, receive what Christ did on the cross, that your old person was crucified with Christ, and therefore I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in this flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Wow. So Peter couldn't experience that yet. See, Jesus told him, though, he told him the truth. He says, listen, I'm going to go to Jerusalem, I'm going to suffer, I'm going to go through many things, they're going to kill me, but I'm going to rise on the third day. He told him, I'm going to rise. He told him, I'm going to resurrect. He was telling him God's will for his life, and Peter rebuked him. Why? Because the Bible says, the flesh warreth against the spirit. The flesh of Peter not only didn't want Jesus to go because he loved Jesus, supposedly, but that flesh nature rose up in him, that carnal nature, that, that sinful nature, the same nature that Satan has, a fallen nature. That fallen nature in Peter didn't want that cross because when it would happen, it would mean the annihilation of himself. Or the power of the annihilation of himself. Because self always stays within you, it never goes. We don't believe in eradication theology. What's that, Pastor? That's when your old nature, some people believe your old nature is taken out. You can never sin again. We don't believe that. Your nature's right there. I'll take you, I'll, go, I'll hide in your trunk and I'll, I'll listen to you as people cut you off and hear the words come out of your mouth. See, tell me your old nature's gone. Amen. <laughs> so here's Peter. Here's the Lord rebuking him. Then we have Peter again. When he said he would never deny Jesus. Let's look at Luke 22 for a moment. Luke 22, starting with verse 31. The Lord says, Simon, Simon, Peter, Peter, behold, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. Can I say that this scripture applies to each and every one of us too? That Satan desires to have you. He wants you. He wants you to stay in the carnality of the flesh. He wants you to be a carnal Christian because he knows you won't be effective for Christ. He wants you to live and try to struggle in your flesh to please God because he knows that if you do... It's not going to matter. Your life won't matter. The only thing the devil is afraid of is someone will believe in what Jesus said will happen on that cross for you, that your old man would be crucified with him so that you could rise in newness of life and walk in that newness of life that he provides by faith in him. And that's what the devil's afraid of because then you'll start doing what Jesus did. Jesus said, as the Father has sent me, even so send I you in the world. And if we allow Christ, through the power of the Holy Spirit, to live in us, and not look at the Holy Spirit as a power or something that we can use to accomplish our will or our purpose, or my ministry, taking the Holy Spirit and saying, okay, now I've got this power and I'm going to go out and do it. No. That's not the whole purpose of the cross. The purpose of the cross is to bring humility in your life. By bringing humility in your life, it's not, Holy Spirit, come with me and I'll show you what we're going to do. No, it's, Holy Spirit, I submit to you. Holy Spirit, work through me. You use me. You use me, not let me use you. Holy Spirit, move through me. And we do that. And when we lay hands on the sick, they shall recover. When we cast out devils, they'll be cast out. When we, hallelujah. Hallelujah. We lay hands on the sick, they shall recover. Because it's not our hands. Christ cannot live in you if you're living in you. If you're full of self and selfishness, if you're full of all that you want for your life is what you want, you'll never allow Christ to live in you. And like Peter, like Peter, this, this is what will happen to you of what I'm going to speak about next. He says, Peter, Satan wants the desire to have you that he may sift you as wheat. Next verse. 
Jesus said, but I prayed for thee, Peter, that your faith will not fail. And then he says this to Peter. And when thou art converted... Peter was a follower, was a disciple of Jesus, a learner, a pupil, but he wasn't converted. Hello? You can be a follower of Jesus, you can come to church and still go to hell. You got to be converted. And only that work can be done, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but by the righteousness of Christ. He said, when you are converted, Peter, strengthen your brother. Next verse. And he said to him, now listen, this is Peter. Okay? Understand, Peter had, you know, he had a, he had a, you know, he wanted to do what was right. But because of that sinful nature living in him, his sinful nature always came forward. He says to the Lord, he says, I'm ready to go with you both to prison to death. Jesus, I'll go to jail for you and I'll, 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 I'll die for you, Jesus. <laughs> Next verse. And he says, I tell you, Peter, the cock shall crow this day before thou shalt three times deny that you even know me. I want you to understand this because a lot of people think that they got plenty of time to receive Christ. You don't have plenty of time. And when the tribulation period comes, if you're having a hard time right now in the carnal, carnality of your flesh, you will never receive Christ. He said to Peter, a follower, a disciple, one who had visibly seen Jesus, ate with Jesus, sat with Jesus, slept where Jesus slept, got up and traveled with Jesus, did ministry with Jesus. And Jesus said, you're not even converted yet. Sure, you're following me. Sure, you're, sure you are a disciple, but you're not converted. That power has not taken place inside of you yet. But when you do, and when it does, strengthen your brother. Now he told, now this is Jesus telling Peter, he says, listen. Okay. Now it would have been something if Jesus would say, look, G Peter, we've gone through this before. You know, you're, you're a little proudful, you know, you're a little, you're always putting your foot in your mouth, you're always out there, you know. Why don't you just listen to me? I'm, the, I'm Christ. I'm the word of God that was made flesh. You know, he could have said that. Peter, I know what I'm talking about. What I say will come to pass. He didn't get that. Why? Because he was still carnal. Look what happens next. Next verse. And he said unto them, When I send you without purse and script and shoes, you lack nothing. They said nothing. Next verse. Then he said unto them, But now the, you have a person. Is that the same scripture? Make sure I'm, I'm on the same page here. 31 and 34. That's not the one. Oh, yes, okay, that, that is the one. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. He said, did you lack anything? They said nothing. Then he said, but now he hath a purse, let him take it, and likewise his script, and he that hath a sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. For I say unto you that this that is written must be accomplished in me and he was reckoned among the transgressors for the time concerning we have an end now go down to verse go down to verse 54 and then they took him meaning Jesus and they led him and brought him into the high priest's house and Peter, what? He followed afar off. Some people don't want to get too close to Jesus because they might lose their life. 
So people don't want to get close to Jesus. They'll follow Jesus afar off. You know, okay, Jesus, I'll follow you afar off. That's as far as I'm going. Uh, I just want enough to get me into heaven. And, you know, I want to be saved. But, you know, I'm, I'm only going to go this far, Lord. I'm going to tell you, if you've, that's your attitude, the same thing that happened to Peter will happen to you. Next verse. And when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the hall and were sat down together, Peter sat down among them. The first thing you will know that when a person begins to turn away from God or grow cold with God, they start to go among the unsaved. Those who follow Jesus are far off are those who would rather be with unsaved people than with Christians. Hello? Next verse. But a certain maid beheld him as he sat by the fire. Well, I don't know why guys are so afraid of girls sometimes. This is a man. This is a fisherman, a rugged guy. You know, you go down a, down a pier down in New Bethany, you see some fishermen. They're rugged, man. You don't see too many sissy, fi uh, you know, uh, too many sissy, uh, you know, fishermen. And the girl looked upon him and said, this man was also with him. Next verse. And he denied him, saying, woman, I don't know him. When you're afraid to stand for Jesus, when you don't allow Jesus to live in your life, like Paul said, you'll deny him. He said, woman, I do not know him. Think about it. Here's, G here's Peter who ate, slept, drank, walked with Jesus, talked with Jesus, had a visible Jesus right before him, walked with him, prayed with him, saw miracles, signs and wonders, everything. But it didn't make a hill of beans because he wasn't converted. He didn't have the reality of the cross working effectually in his life. Next verse. And after a while, another saw him and said, Thou art also of them. And Peter said, Man, I'm not. Next verse. And about the space of one hour after another, con confidently affirming, saying of a truth, This fellow also was with him. He's a Galilean. I know this guy is a follower of Jesus. What happens? Next verse. And Peter said, Man, I know not what thou sayest. And immediately while he yet spoke, what happened? Now, another um, gospel says he began to curse. You know, fishermen can curse. You ever been around some fishermen, man? They can curse. Now Peter began to curse. His whole nature started coming out. I tell you, blankety, blankety, blank, blank. I'm giving you an oath by this. I swear by God, I don't know the man. The cock crew. Verse 61, watch this. The Lord turned and he looked at Peter. I wonder what emotion was in the Lord's eyes to look upon Peter. He didn't say a word. He just turned and looked. And then Peter remembered the word of the Lord. How he had said unto him, Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. I want you to understand this next verse is the beginning of Peter's healing and deliverance. Next verse. And Peter went out and wept bitterly. There was a conviction you know, there's a Toyota commercial, just one look, that's all it took. But I believe that that one look, 
that Jesus gave Peter, there was something of a penetration of the very, very uh, insights of Christ that went deep into Peter's soul when he turned and looked at Peter. And those words came back to remembrance what, Peter, what Jesus had said to him. And it was the word of God that brought the conviction. Oh, how we need the conviction of the Holy Spirit back in the church. And he spoke and Peter went out and he wept bitterly. There was a genuine repentance happening in Peter, but he didn't know what to do. What would be the next step? And I'm trying to show you the difference between a person who lived the life I'm talking about in the flesh, but yet you're going to see the change. You're going to see the metamorphosis that took place in Peter's life. Watch. Then he began to slip back after that into his old ways. John 21, verse 3. You can put that up on the screen for me. John 21, 3. John 21, 3. It's the time when Peter was going through this time of sorrow and repentance. How many, how many have ever gone through a point in your life where you've said, well, I feel Christ so much, I might as well go back to my old ways of life because I just feel God so much and I don't feel there's any hope left for me. You ever feel that way? Peter felt that way. He felt that, hey, there's nothing I can do now. I've, I really messed it up. I messed it up big time. Here I denied even knowing Jesus. There's no hope for me now. I mean, Jesus said, if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my father. Some of those scriptures might have been going through Peter's mind. And the devil might have been tormenting him and saying, you, you, you never have forgiveness again. You can never be restored again. You can never be forgiven again. So why don't you just give up and go back fishing? And Peter says, I'm going back fishing. And they all said to him, we go with you. Don't ever think that your life doesn't affect other people. They went forth into the ship immediately after that night and they caught nothing. Can I tell you something? You go back to your old way of life, you'll catch nothing in life. You'll never be happy. You'll never have peace. You'll never have joy. You may have all of the riches of this world. But the Bible says, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his soul? Amen. It means nothing. We should not continue in the things and the ways we used to live. You and I will remain carnal Christians if we continue to try to please Christ in our fleshly endeavors and works. God does not want us renewed. We are made new. Hello. God doesn't re-glue. He makes new. It is imperative that we understand what the Christian life is and what our responsibility is to it. And we can, if we understand both, the, both intellectually and spiritually, this next scripture which is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 15. I'm going to give you a little exercise, scripture exercise, so you can look it up. Second Corinthians 5.15 says this. How are we doing back there? Got it? There we go. Wherefore, from this time forward, that's what henceforth means. Know we no man after the flesh. No, that's not the one. 2 Corinthians 5.15 That's 16? Yeah. After that, he died, right? For who? 
For who? Are you part of all? Yes. yes. That they which live should not, what? From this time forward, what? To live unto themselves, but unto what? Who what? For them and what? Amen. I'm going to read this out of the uh, NASB. Just give me a moment. 2 Corinthians 5, 16. If I can see this little small print. Wow. I got it, I think. Second Corinthians, what is it? Five fifteen, right? Second Corinthians five fifteen. And he died for all, so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. You have an obligation. He died for you. And that you which are alive should not from this time forward, once you have accepted Christ, live to yourselves. Amen. To satisfy the flesh, to satisfy your th you know, yourself. There's three things in the scripture. Number one, establish truth. Number two, the reason and the purpose. That he died, he died for all. That's established truth. The reason, they which live, and the purpose, should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them, and rose from the dead. If you compare this well-known scripture, I say well-known because you know what we're talking about. We've gone through this in Romans. Uh, Romans 6.4. Let's look at that a moment. Romans 6, 4 says this, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. We should walk in newness of life, not by us trying to make it happen by the flesh, but because of the work of the cross that has worked inside of us. Because we are dying daily. Paul said, I die daily. The initial truth of it is, it is no longer I that liveth, but Christ lives in me. But the actual promotion of that, or the actual function of that, is I die daily. Because you will always come up with something in life that will cause you to have to make a decision. And I'm going to die. I'm not going to live to that thing. Temptation comes. Sin comes to you. Friend calls you up and says, come on, we're going night clubbing. I want to take you out night clubbing. I don't want to go. Well, why don't you want to go? I, I, I just don't want to go. You almost kind of back, you know, kind of back off. You know, speak the truth. Tell them. Amen. Say, I don't go to the nightclubs anymore because that Linda is dead and no longer is functioning in my life. Amen. Amen. Hello. Amen. Old buddy calls you on the phone. Darren, come on, let's go. We're gonna have a few. Few. We're gonna go belt a few. Come on, I'm gonna pay. Now that's a temptation. Now what does he say? No, no, no. What he needs is make a proclamation of truth and say, Bill or John or whatever your name is, I want you to understand something right now. The Darren that you knew no longer lives. Darren is dead. 
And I'm alive unto God through Jesus Christ who loved me and gave himself for me. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. Say, thank you, Jesus, that I don't have to live a, a, a defeated Christian life any longer because of the blood of Jesus, because of the cross of Calvary, because of what took place on that operation on the table of the cross. It is no longer I that liveth, but Christ. When I see selfishness in a Christian, I know that there's an area that have, has not been brought to the cross of Calvary. That's an area of their life they're still not submitting to the Lord Jesus Christ. Come on. We need to reiterate the point that if you are a Christian, not a carnal Christian, then 2 Corinthians 5.15 is what is your what to do. You need to no longer live to yourself. You're obligated. It's a command. It's imperative. We know that Peter repented, Right? Let's look at John 21 for a moment. John 21. Starting with verse 15. So when they had dined, they had eaten. They were together again. Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, do you love me? If Christ was alive today, standing before you instead of me, and he asked you those questions, that if he asked you that question, Lisa, do you love me? Carolyn, do you love me? But understand the question that Jesus was asking. Because people read over this scripture so fast, they don't, they don't understand. When Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? He was asking Peter if he loved him with the agape love, which is the unconditional love. Do you love me unconditionally, Peter, that you will surrender your life to me? And let me live my life through you so that it's no longer you that liveth, but I live inside of you. Look what Peter says. He said to him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. The love, the word love here in Peter's response was not agape love. It was phileo in the Greek, love. It means a friendship or a friendship. He was fond of Jesus and he was his friend. He didn't answer the question. He, Jesus was asking him, do you love me unconditional agape love? Unconditional love. Will you surrender your life to me, totally to me? Peter, do you love me that way? Peter says, you know that I love you, phileo you. I have a fondness for you as a friend. Then he said to him, feed my lamb. What he was trying to do was get Peter to confess and to look at how he really... Because a lot of times we say we love God. A lot of times we think we mean we love God, but we really don't. And, and Jesus was saying, well, if you love me, if you dedicated your life to me, if you consecrated your life to me, if you are unconditionally giving me your life, well, you're not making all the decisions of your life anymore, why aren't you feeding my lambs? Why are you going back fishing? Why are you going back to the old way of life? Why are you hanging around the old friends again? Why are you going to the old places again? If you really love me, Peter. Next verse. Then Jesus asks him, Jesus asks him again, a second time. Simon, son of Jonas, do you agape me? 
Why did Jesus ask him a second time? Because when Jesus is speaking, he's trying to get Peter to humbly look at what he was saying to him and to come out and just be humble enough to say, you know what, Lord, I really don't love you. I'm a, I have a fondness of you like a friend, but... He said, he said to him, yea, Lord, you know that I phileo you. He said again, feed my sheep. If you are saying you love me, why aren't you doing what I'm asking you to do? Do you see the connection? If you love me and I'm supposed to, you're supposed to be consecrated and dedicated to me, and you're not supposed to compromise your life, you're supposed to let me be the center of your life. I'm supposed to be unconditionally active in your life. He said, Lord, you know that I phileo you again. He said to him, feed my sheep. Now watch this next one. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? This time Jesus uses the word phileo. He doesn't use the word agape. He's now questioning Peter whether his fondness and friendship is really true or not. He said, Lord, see, so now when he asked him this question, boy, this penetrated Peter's heart. What does he say to the Lord? You know all things. I can't fool you, God. I can fool people, but I can't fool you, God. You know all things. Thou knowest that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. This was the beginning of Peter's restoration. What made the difference in Peter's life? Number one, it was humility. But something else took place in Peter's life. What took place in, in Peter's life was the day of Pentecost. When he got baptized with the Holy Spirit. With the evidence of speaking in tongues. Peter went from being a coward that day to being courageous. Peter went from denying Christ to actually being willing to die for Christ. There was such a change. Why? Because when he was baptized with the Holy Spirit, the Spirit gave confirmation to the words that Jesus had spoken. It gave confirmation to the exact thing that took place on Calvary. Hello. And he realized that he needed not his own power to live the life, but he needed the power of the Holy Spirit to be able to do what Christ wanted him to do in his life. Many of you know that Peter, later on in life, when he was martyred for the faith, when he was killed, they were going to crucify Peter and it was Peter's request that the, the cross be turned upside down because he didn't feel worthy to be crucified like his Savior. And Peter died a death upside down on a cross, nailed to a cross. The one who was a coward, the one that would deny the very person of Jesus Christ in his life because of a woman, because of, of the unsaved, all of a sudden now became a warrior for Christ. He became one who was willing to die and to suffer for Christ. But let me tell you, unless you are converted, hello? You can be a follower of Jesus, you can be a disciple of Jesus, you can walk with Jesus and still deny him like Peter did. Because the same devil that was alive back then is the same devil that's alive today. And he wants to sift you like wheat. And he'll use science if he has to, has to. He'll use the physical ailment if he has to. Whatever he has to, he will lie to you and deceive you because that's his two weapons, lies and deceit. And he'll deceive you into thinking, you're okay. There's nothing wrong with you. 
Don't take this Christian thing too serious. Don't, you don't need to go to church and hear the word of God and get encouraged and get lifted up and, and, get, you know, and uh, get right with God and, and, and move in the power of the Holy Spirit. You don't have to hear that message, Christ in you, the hope of glory. You don't have to, you don't have to come to church and hear Christ lives in me. Why do you want that? You don't want that. That's what the devil will tell you. The devil will say, you're too stupid. You're not equipped to let Christ live in you. You know what you need to tell the devil? You're absolutely right. I'm not equipped. But what happened to me on the day of Calvary up on that cross made me equipped. My source is not the flesh. My source is the spirit of what took place on that cross. When Jesus was on the cross, I was on his mind. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame. All of you listening to me here and all of you listening by CD and by the, by the DVD we're recording. You were the joy that was set before him. The joy of knowing that one day in all the portals of eternity and time that there would be a time, Jen, when you would come and see the truth of Jesus in your life that brought joy to Jesus because he knows that he restored you back to the Father hallelujah and you can put every one of your names there to know that, that you've been restored by the grace of God hallelujah by the power of God and how now because he did so much for us how we owe our lives to him Hallelujah. We owe our lives to him to no longer live our lives after the flesh like the Bible says in 2 Corinthians. We are debtors to God to not live this life after the flesh but after the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God lives in you. Lord Jesus, we need your power. So many people are worried about, well, if I commit to Christ, he's going to ask me to do something. Yeah. But see, as Peter was a follower, as Peter was a disciple, as Peter was walking with the physical Jesus, if Jesus said to him, Peter, you're going to be crucified upside down and follow me, Peter would go, uh-uh, not me. But see, in his flesh, he would have said, oh, Lord, I'll die with you. Cut the servant's ear off. Oh yeah, Jesus, I'll die with you. Yep. Big mouth. But believe me, a little woman turned to him and said, you're one of them. I don't know the man. Don't put so much confidence in your flesh that you'll be able to serve Christ in the end time. The Bible says don't put your confidence in the flesh. Here's Peter that walked with Jesus. Come on. I mean, what more do you need? He walked with Jesus and he had all the confidence that, Lord, that's not going to happen to you. You're not going to the cross. Mm -mm. Oh, but one minute it was, oh, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. He did all of those things. And he was still lost. Jesus said, when you are converted, are you converted? Are you really saved? Or are you just going through the motions? I don't know your hearts. I don't know. I know some of you. I know some of you are saved, but I don't know if all of you are saved. I don't know your life. God knows your life. I can only judge by the fruits you produce. What are you producing? I know when I go shopping for fruit, I hate soft mushy fruit you like anybody like soft mushy fruit oh. no we're always feeling for the good you know ripe ones the hard ones that are just about ripe you know you want to get those bananas that they're still green but not all green you know because you know they're going to turn very soon you know to me it doesn't make any difference because I like it when they get really black because I give them to Annie she makes me cake <laughs> but 
can you say, truly, Christ lives in me? Can I say that? For the most part, yes, but there's still some areas that I need to die daily. I'm faced with decisions every single day. I'm, f I'm faced with temptations every single day, just like all of you. And I have to choose. But I want you to know I'm not choosing of my own ability. I'm able to choose with the ability that Christ gives from the strength that is from within, that I can fight against temptation. Before, the outward couldn't, I always just cave. <laughs> Go do what I want to do. You know what I'm saying? You know, it's like making a New Year's resolution. You make a resolution, then 20 minutes later, you go do the same thing you just resoluted for. We can't do that. So can we sing a song? You. fresh commitment to the Lord say Jesus I want you to be alive in me I want you to come now Christ now lives in me. 
I am crucified with Christ, therefore I no longer live. Jesus Christ now lives in me. Sing it one more time, make the devil mad. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Jesus, today is a different day. I'm a debtor, Lord to live after the flesh but after the spirit I am crucified with Christ therefore I no longer live Jesus Christ now lives in me crucified with Christ therefore I no longer live Jesus Christ now lives in me just tell him just tell
tell them right now. This is the area of my life, Lord, that I have not crucified. And I'm willing to do it today, Lord. Crucified with you, Lord. It's no longer I that live. But Christ now lives. And the life that I now live flesh I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. For 
remember when you go to a funeral and you see someone that's dead in the coffin they're dead they don't come back they'll be resurrected someday but that's what Jesus wants to do in your life Consider that old man dead, consider him gone, consider him crucified, so Christ can live in you. Father, we thank you. Thank you for the truth of your word. If you need prayer this morning, come up to the altar, I'll pray with you. Brother Bob, you can play something on the. If you need prayer, come on up forward. I'll pray with you. Otherwise, the service is dismissed.